then on April 17th will be Easter, and so I just wanted to make you aware of that. If you have your Bibles, we are going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5 this morning. If you don't have a Bible, there's one right there in front of you, a little black one. You can pull that out. 1 Peter chapter 5 will be in the last three verses. 1 Peter 5, verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, Typically at the end of a sermon series we're all ready for it to be done and get on to the next thing And so the pastor just kind of ties the last three verses in with like the previous sermon and we just kind of get through those But some of these junior high girls have been excited to hear me preach on greet each other with the kiss of love And so I wanted to give a whole sunday to that particular topic and we'll do that today. I'm just kidding. Sorry <laughs> 29th and final sermon in first peter I hope it's been uh, hopefully uh, half as good for you as it has been for me. I get to study it every week and dig in, and this is the first time I've taken a, a letter, an epistle, and done like a verse or two verses or three verses and just really, really dug down in it. And uh, man, it's been exciting and been fun for me. Living hope in a difficult world, because about 2,000 years ago, Christians were living in a really difficult time. Christians that were scattered throughout Asia Minor, not just living in the great cities of Rome and Ephesus and Corinth, but scattered throughout modern Turkey, ancient Asia Minor, were having a really tough time being Christians. They weren't necessarily being burned at the stake. They weren't necessarily being taken out and being beaten or stoned or things like that. But they were experiencing isolation, and they were experiencing some of the very things that we experienced 2,000 years later. In 2,000 years, not much has changed for being Christians. And in the first century, it was a difficult world to be a Christian, and they needed to understand what living hope looked like. And for 21st century Christians, we live in a difficult world, a world where it's difficult to be a Christian, and we need living hope. This past week, I went fishing for the first time this spring with my friend Ed, and Ed had given me a, a t-shirt a while back, and it says on it, it says, Jesus is my savior, fishing is my therapy. I, th I like that. I need a lot of therapy, and so anyway. So we went fishing on Thursday, uh, yeah, Thursday, I think it was. Anyway, we, went, went, we go out, we go fishing, and we had to stop at the store to get some food and some bait and things like that. And I went into the store, and I realized, like, I got a couple of, like, I wasn't thinking about it. We just went in, and, and like, the lady behind the cash register, like, would barely even look at me and barely talk to me. And didn't think much about it. I was like, well, she's kind of mean, but we'll, we'll move on. And I got to the lake, and I got some other, like, responses that for a while, I was like, well, that's, people just seem to be mean today. What is going on? Well, then later, when I was washing my hands and I looked in the mirror, I remembered that I had the Jesus is my Savior emblazoned across my chest. And I thought, huh, I wonder if there's a correlation between the way that those people were treating me and the fact that I was advertising Jesus. We live in a world where it's getting more and more difficult to advertise Jesus. It's getting more and more difficult to say that you're a Christian and be seen as a sane person. Peter's first readers were experiencing that as well, and what they needed was that great thread that has run through the book of 1 Peter, and that is living hope. You see, through all of this, as Peter has told us, told us at the very beginning, that we were elect exiles of the dispersion, that we were this exiled people, that we weren't at home, that we were sojourners somewhere that wasn't our final destination and he talked to us over and over again about suffering we, we understood that the great theme that threaded itself through this book was hope in christ that although there's suffering for christ that there's always hope present hope future hope in christ and that's been the great theme and it's meant to be a great encouragement to us as christians because the songs that we've already sung this morning talk about our hope in christ talk about what it means to have a relationship with Christ and that I can face whatever it looks like to be a Christian in this world having hope in Christ. These last three verses are vital for us. And what would happen in ancient Greco-Roman letters is that they would put the stuff that we usually put at the beginning, they would put it all the way at the end. 
And that's what we're going to get today. This is the, the conclusion of the letter. But what I find so interesting is that what we're going to get today is some relationships that are vital and that are so important in strengthening our hope. That what Peter is going to do in three verses as he closes the letter is he's going to talk about five key relationships for strengthening our living hope. Because as we finish this letter, as we go out and we do what we're going to do throughout the course of this week and we live as Christians in the world that God's called us to live in, relationships are key. Relationships are important. And so I hope as we finish today, we'll see that. And I'll give you again five of them. The first one we'll see in verse 12. The first relationship that's key is that we need faithful Christian friends. And he says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Now, you may not have heard of Silvanus. So he's only, he comes up a couple of times in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, some of your translations, as you're looking at it now and saying, Who is that guy? Because it has a different name there, right? So S Silvanus is the Latinized name of a, of a Greek name that may sound more familiar. How many of you have heard of a guy named Silas? You've heard of Silas, Paul, and Silas? This is your chance, by the way, to show how much Bible you know. Silas, raise your, there you go, right? This is Paul's traveling companion on the second missionary journey. His name was Silas. He's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians in the greetings when he's along with Paul and others. As a matter of fact, Silas slash Silvanus was one of the, the carriers of the Jerusalem Council's letter in Acts 15. If you remember, um, a, a real question, the theological question had come up between some of the Jewish churches and some of the Gentile churches. And, and Paul and Barnabas are there in Acts 15. They come back to the mother church in Jerusalem and they're talking it through and trying to figure out what they are going to do about this sticky theological issue. And this Jerusalem council of the big church leaders in that day writes a letter. And they're going to send it out in the name of these church leaders and apostles. And they're going to send it out. And they need faithful men to go out and to disseminate this letter. That's what happened in that day. And they needed faithful people to go out. And we know that Paul and Barnabas went. But we also know from Acts 15 that this guy, Silas, was one of the guys who went out. And he was one of the letter carriers. And that's actually going to... Uh, serve our purposes here in just a minute that he was found faithful to be one of these letter carriers Silas was part of the core leadership in the early church. He provided uh, Guidance and help with the apostles. There are various times where we see him uh, In Acts and in in the New Testament where he's helping out Paul or helping out other people Probably at this time he's probably actually in Rome with Peter with Mark, as we're going to see, the writer of the Gospel of Mark, and Silas, they're probably all there together as a team, and there may have even been others who were there together in the great city of Rome, uh, establishing a gospel outpost there. We know from history that both Peter and Paul had ministries in Rome, maybe simultaneously or close together, establishing a gospel outpost in the capital of the empire in that day. And so Silas was one of the guys who was there. It's possible that he was what is called the amanuensis or the scribe that peter would have been talking and that sylvanus silas would have been writing down what peter was saying that's possible but due to the sentence construction the original language here what's more probable is that silas was actually the carrier of this letter as i said before he was the carrier of that Jerusalem council letter. He knew what it was like to have important correspondence given to him to take throughout the uh, Roman world at that time. This was important correspondence that needed to get to God's people. If Peter was, in fact, as we think, in Rome, and he was writing to these distressed churches in rural Asia Minor and needed to get this letter to them, he needed a faithful and a trustworthy letter carrier to take that letter. In addition to that, he needed someone because in that day, the letter carrier wouldn't just show up on your front door, knock on it, pull it out of his mailbag, and hand it to you. He would have, in fact, gone into the church or churches, the houses that were there, and he would have been the first one to open that inspired document that was given from the Holy Spirit to Peter, and, and, and Silas would have been the first one to read that letter to the churches. And he would have read it, but he would have done something akin to what I'm doing today, that he would have read it and, and provided some explanation of it. In addition to that, each of those churches would have then given him information on how they were doing because they didn't have the internet and Twitter and things like that. 
they would have given him information, which he would have then carried back to the gospel outpost in Rome so that Peter and the others would know what was happening. He was an integral part to the communication of the gospel and the communication of this encouraging message. Peter says he was a faithful brother as I regard him. This is apostolic commendation. This is one of the leaders in the church, one of those who were closest to Christ, commending this man so that when he showed up, it would be like a missionary coming into our church and saying, I have a message from so-and-so. And if that was an important person in our gospel circles, and they said that they were commending this messenger to share a message, we would listen intently. And that's what Peter is saying here, that he was a faithful brother as I regard him, that, that Silvanus, that Silas, had been entrusted with much. In fact, he had been entrusted with much over a period of time. This wasn't his first test. This wasn't the first letter that he had been given. That this was something that he had done over and over throughout the course of time. Faithful Christian friends and faithful Christian co-workers are those who are trustworthy. Those who we can give important spiritual tasks to and entrust with important spiritual things. We can entrust our spiritual lives to them because they're trustworthy. In fact, they're proven. They're, they're, they're people who over and over and over again have proven themselves faithful. Trustworthy Christian friends and Christian companions are not the people that you met three weeks ago. They may not even be the people you met a few months ago. For me, these may be... One would be a buddy that I went to college with. Another is a guy that I went to seminary with and that I've known for years and years and years. Another one or two are men who are sitting here in these pews that I've known over the course of years and been able to go to over and over and over again, and they've proven themselves trustworthy over and over again. Faithful Christian friends are spiritually reliable. In other words, I know that they're going to give me spiritual advice. When I come to them and I say, man, I'm having a real problem with my wife and she just won't listen to me, they're going to tell me the problem's really mine because it always is, right? Yeah, they're spiritually reliable. I can count on them to tell me the truth, not just what I want to hear. They can be counted on. Men like Sylvanus help shoulder the burdens and help share the ministry. Those are important, important aspects to these people that we need and we need in our lives that we need people who we can help it was really cool even this morning watching a bunch of different people do ministry around here most of you don't get to see all of that but it's really fun when we see people setting things up and people running sound and people putting instruments together and all the behind the scenes stuff that happens and ladies in the nursery and the kids ministry and it's just kind of like a little ant farm running around over here right because those people are faithful and they've done it over and over again and they're reliable and we're thankful for that. One of the things that we tell the girls quite often is that we want them to have a variety of friends. We want them to be involved in people's lives and be a light to different people. But I often tell them, make your closest friends your Christian friends. Make your closest friends your Christian friends. And our girls are at public school, and they have the opportunity to have some different friends and have impact, and some of the girls have come over to our house, and we have the opportunity to show them what it looks like to be a family and sit down and eat dinner together and pray and not yell and things like that. But I tell them over and over again, make your Christian friends your closest friends because we also say, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future, right? And what I want them to have is faithful Christian friends. It's been a huge blessing to see our youth group explode over the course of the last year, year and a half. That we've got about 30 kids that meet on Wednesday nights from 7th through 12th grade, and we get to watch them like have interaction and have relationship with each other and, and, and be able to push each other spiritually. And, and they push me in a lot of other ways, I'll just be honest. Um, but to see them, to see them like connect with each other, like, I want my girls, and I want your kids, and Jason and I talk about it quite a bit, and he helps me out. It's like, we want our kids to develop that where our Christian friends are our closest friends because we share the values, and we can be those faithful friends who are there in tough times. This is so important. He says, I have written to you briefly, and you're like, it took 29 weeks to get through this, I've written you briefly. Like, pastors all say the same thing, don't we? In conclusion, I have six more points. 
He says, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. When he says exhorting and declaring there in the text, um, another way that that is uh, translated is encouraging and testifying. And Peter says, through this, brother, I'm encouraging you and I'm testifying. Here's what I know. In difficult times, we need faithful friends who will speak encouraging gospel truth into our lives and into our circumstances. Let me say it a different way. You need friends who know this book and who can open this book and can talk to you about this book when you're going through a really tough time. But you don't just need your pastor to be able to do that. Ladies, you need that girlfriend who you can call up and say, man, I'm really struggling with X, Y, Z. And then that person can, can exhort you, encourage you with this. Exhort and encourage you with this and not just something that they found on you know, Pinterest. Not just something that they found on this latest blog but that they can exhort and encourage you with what is the true grace of God. See, we need good Christian friends who can speak gospel truth into our lives. We need good, faithful friends who are willing to speak truth into our lives. We say sometimes that, that soft words produce hard hearts, but that hard words can, can produce soft hearts. And sometimes we need those faithful friends who can encourage and can exhort, which is like a stronger word, a stronger term. They can sit across the table from us and can look us in the eye and can say, you know what? You need to hear this from God's word. Those are faithful Christian friends. So this morning I'd ask you, like, who are your faithful Christian friends? Who are those people in your life that would, would take that role? Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's guys. Maybe it's a, a good, solid, faithful buddy who's proven himself faithful. If you don't have those friends, this is a good time and a good place to start cultivating some of those friends and some of those friendships. We can help you along in that process. I'll speak more about that in a minute. We need faithful Christian friends. The first part of the next verse, he says another key, another important relationship for strengthening your hope is what we'll call fellow Christian exiles. He says this, verse 13, She who is at Babylon who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. That may sound veiled at first, and it actually is a, a veiled terminology. She who is at Babylon, what is that supposed to mean? Well, he's talking about the church at Rome, and I'll tell you why we kind of know that and have an idea of that. Originally, as most of you know, Babylon in the 6th century B.C. was that nation that came in and, and, and took God's people captive and, and took them into exile. And so Babylon was the original land of exile, literally, for the people of God. But then down through the centuries and ages from that time until the time of the first century in the in, uh, New Testament of the church, Babylon was used metaphorically w when God's people wanted to talk about any time that they were like in exile, in a place or around people that wasn't, quote, home to them. And so Babylon equaled being in exile, being in a place that wasn't home. We know that because the Apostle John uses that in the book of Revelation. There's intertestamental Jewish liter that, literature that uses the same terminology uh, to talk about different world powers and rulers of that day, calling that Babylon. And in this day, Peter is, as far as we know, in Rome, and Rome is the great power of the day. And so when he's talking about she who is at Babylon, he's using it metaphorically to talk about the church that is in Rome. One of the really cool things that Peter is doing here at the end of his letter is, is he is uh, providing what is called an inclusio. If you look at chapter 1, verse 1, and you look at chapter 5, verse 13, these verses, he's tying it all together. Remember when he called his uh, readers, his, the people that he addressed, the elect exiles of the dispersion? What he's doing here is he is now talking about she who is at Babylon, the church in Rome, exiled in this place that was a place of exile, who is likewise chosen. In other words, Peter is identifying himself and his church as sharing in that status with them. All throughout this book, Peter has been reminding these Christians in Asia Minor that they were exiles, that they were, they were not in the place that was their home but that they were elect and chosen by God. And now he wraps that all up by saying, she, the church, who is in exile in Rome, who is also chosen, sends greetings. And in doing that, he's saying, we're in this together. 
that there's a togetherness. He's saying, we know what you're going through. You're not walking alone. And as Peter is writing, he could be sitting in a place where he had no idea what they were going through. And if you've ever received counsel and you're in a difficult time and you receive counsel from someone who has no idea what it's like to go through that, you've been there? And that person who doesn't have any kids is like, well, what you need to do with those little brats is, right? Or somebody who's never had a physical difficulty in their life, and they're like, well, what you need to drink for that is, and you're like, oh, here we go. This is going to get weird quick, right? Yeah, somebody who's never gone through divorce says to you, oh, well, it'll be okay because it just doesn't hold that weight, does it? But if you've ever, maybe you're the person who, finds out that you have cancer and somebody else who's walked through that themselves comes along beside you and says you know what this is going to be the most difficult fight of your life but God will not leave you and he will not forsake you and I as your friend won't either and I've been there before doesn't that hold some weight right and what Peter is trying to show these people at the end of this letter is that hey you're not walking alone He's saying, you're elect exiles of the dispersion, but this church in the great city of Rome is in exile as well, and they're chosen as well. That there are fellow Christian exiles around us today. Isn't it great that we're not the only Christians in Puyallup? Right? Like, we're not the only people gathered together in a church listening to someone preach God's word today. We're not the only people with our hands raised in worship to God today. That there are lots of good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches that are here and that are around. Like, we want that to be the case because that strengthens my faith to know that they're all over the place. Have you ever been to, like, one of those Christian concerts and you've been like, yes, like, there are more than just me out there, right? You go to a big Christian conference. Some of our couples went to the G3 conference in Atlanta last year, and and thousands of good, godly, Bible-believing Christians gathered together in Atlanta, right and you say like there's strength in numbers and like we talked about last week there's this solidarity that's there and this togetherness because we're all together and we're walking in this together we need to know that we're not alone we need to know that we're not the only ones because that provides us strength and i think one of the things that can happen at least for pastors and maybe for some of you is i I think we sometimes in america we we come at the church with with a football team mentality rather than coming at the, the church with a military mentality. Here's what I mean by that. Like, if you have a favorite football team that you root for, and someone else roots for a different football team, that other team is the competition, right? If your favorite basketball team in March Madness right now is still there, like my Duke Blue Devils are, let's go, okay? Like, all the other teams are the competition. And sometimes I think that's how we view churches. Like, we're the church in Puyallup, and then all those other churches are the competition, right we're the duke blue devils and all the rest of them are the ones that are trying to beat the duke blue devils out of the tournament and what happens in america is we get a competition mentality when it relates to church right we brand our church and our church is the best church and the great church and look at all the things that our church is doing and you don't want to go to that church you want to come to this church we tell people all the time there may be a better church for you out there and if there is and they're teaching the bible and they're preaching god's word and they're helping you grow in your faith they're on our team And doing that whole, like, football thing and that whole competition thing is great for March Madness. But when you're going to go to war, we need a military mentality. And I know, because I had a brother who was in the Marines, and I've talked to some of you who are in the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, and I know that there can be some friendly competitiveness, right? Come on. Nobody's going to say, like, hoorah. But when you go to war, do you think those guys are like, I'm not playing with the Navy, no, 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 I'm the Marines. And you're like, you guys are part of the same branch. No way, right? No, you're all in it together. You have different jobs, you have different ideas and things like that, but you are all in it together. That's what the church needs to look like. We need to be fellow Christian exiles, and absolutely, we need to stand against some of the garbage that's happening, that's calling itself church, that's actually leading people astray. That happens, and we need to stand against that stuff. But we, what we need is we need less of a competition mentality and more of a cooperation mentality in understanding that there are fellow Christian exiles all around the Puget Sound 
there are fellow Christian exiles all around Western Washington, and we feel like exiles, amen, in Western Washington. And there are those that live in Eastern Washington, and they feel better about their exile. And in Idaho, it's like the further you move east, the better you feel about your exile, right? But we need each other to help each other and to strengthen each other. And when he says, she who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, he's reminding them, you're not in this alone. You're not walking alone. We need those relationships. And, and maybe for Easter, you're going to go to your families, and you're not going to be here, and you're going to go to another Bible-preaching church. Man, soak that in, right? Look around, whatever that auditorium is, and say, fellow Christian exiles. You go to work, and there are people there who are at another Bible-teaching, Jesus-loving church. Fellow Christian exiles, man, encourage. Continue to encourage each other. He'll give us a third relationship. That is significant spiritual investments. These are really important. He says at the end of verse 13, Likewise, so does Mark, my son. This is a cool story if you know anything about Mark in the New Testament. This Mark is not Peter's actual biological son. He's actually John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. And some really interesting things about him, if you're not familiar. So he was a companion, you'll remember. Mark, John Mark was a companion of Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey. And the scripture says that John Mark, when they were going from one place to the next, turned back. And we're not told why he turned back, but what we are told is that Paul got really upset that John Mark turned back, and then wouldn't take him the next time they were going to go on a trip. And in fact, what happened is that Paul, the Apostle Paul, and his traveling companion Barnabas got so mad at each other because of John Mark that they split. And that Paul went off to do his thing, and Barnabas took Mark, and they did their thing as well. And Paul then had a different partner. Do you remember what his name was, by the way? It's that guy that's right up there in verse 12. Paul took Silas, and they went off, and they were on their journey, and then Barnabas went with Mark, and they did what they were going to do. But then later in life, we know that Paul and John Mark somehow made amends, and that there was restoration of that relationship. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, tells us that Peter actually went to church at Mark's house. It says it right there, that they were associated with each other, that John Mark was a younger man, that Peter was older. Church tradition actually tells us, they, church tradition, some of the early church fathers who were around, right around this time, actually says that Mark was Peter's interpreter, that they spent a lot of time together, and that even the gospel of Mark, and many scholars, myself included, believe, not, not that I'm a scholar, sorry, many scholars and me, many scholars and random guys like me, believe, believe that, that Mark wrote the gospel of Mark as Peter's eyewitness account of the life of Christ. And that Peter had lived it and had done it and had, had done all of those things and that he was close with John Mark and that he was actually the mentor for John Mark. And that when John Mark, when Mark was writing the gospel of Mark that we have today, that it was Peter telling him about those stories and giving him all the things that he was giving him and that Mark wrote that down. And, and church, uh, again, early church fathers say and believe the same thing. So Mark was a younger man whom Peter had invested in. And as I told you, right now, Peter and Mark and Silas and probably others were in Rome, in exile. But they were together. There's this team mentality that they were together doing gospel ministry. What I know about discipling is that discipling strengthens the faith of the disciple but if you've ever discipled or taught someone, you know that discipling other people strengthens your faith usually more than it does theirs. For me as a pastor, doing this week in and week out and week in and week out strengthens me much more than it strengthens any of you. Discipling kids in youth ministry. Because you know why? It makes me dig in and makes me study and kids have amazing questions. And it makes you really think and it makes you really wonder. And some of the stuff that adults will let you get away with, like kids are totally, uh-uh. Like an adult will just smile and in their mind think, he's an idiot. The kids will actually tell you, no, you're an idiot. Right? Yeah. But, but, but discipling other people, making significant spiritual investments strengthens your faith. And I find it interesting that here Peter is in Rome writing this letter as an older man. He's, he's an older man at this time and walked through what he walked through. 
And some of you parents would not want young Peter discipling your kids. But as an old guy, Peter had something to offer. Let me say that a little bit differently. Some of you think that you're out of the game. Some of you think my time is done. Some of you think, you know what, I put in my hours, I put in my years, I put in my time. And some of you have more to offer than any of the rest of us have at all because of your experience and your faithfulness to the gospel. The grayer my hair gets, I feel the, 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 the more equipped that I become. And so I'm looking around, I'm like, there are some of you who are much more equipped than me. Amen? Come on, right? You're like, what about no hair? Does that count as well? No, but honestly, man, you know what? There are opportunities to make significant spiritual investment. Here at our church, there are some places. We don't want just anyone to sign up to be a youth leader or a kids ministry leader. We don't just want warm bodies in those rooms with those impressionable young people. But let me tell you something, man. With 30-some kids in youth ministry, we could use some help. We could use some spiritually seasoned men, spiritually seasoned women who would come alongside and sit in that room on Wednesday nights and put up with some of the shenanigans and craziness and laugh and have a good time and make a significant spiritual investment. Our kids' ministry and our nursery is like exploding, if you didn't know. We need people who would make significant spiritual investments. And what I can guarantee you is that if you make that investment in someone else, it's going to strengthen your faith as well. Those are important we have men's ministry, ladies' ministry, all of those places where we need people to make some significant spiritual investments right now. And I would just ask you to consider that and to think about that. If you're in that place where, you're, you know, your relationship with the Lord is, is at least in the direction that it needs to be, and you're growing and you have a desire to make that investment, talk to me, talk to Pastor Lauren when he gets back, fill out that digital connect card, let us know, because we need people to make those investments where we're at in a church right now. Another relationship that's so vital and important is a supportive spiritual family. And here we go. Stretch. Get ready to run from these girls. <laughs> Greet one another with the holy handshake of love. Ah, oh, man, I misrepresented. That must have been the message. I was reading out of the message. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Now, what? Because Paul says it a couple times. Now, Peter's saying it. What is that all about? And it's actually, again, if you dig into the context of some of these things, it's really interesting. I know you're thinking about your trip to Europe when everybody's walking up to each other and kissing each other on the double cheek, right? I've never met you before. This is weird, right? This was a standard Greco-Roman greeting in that day. Um, for some, it was actually a kiss on the lips. Weird, I know. Like, if you've ever seen, I know my father-in-law went to India, and this was like the standard for men. Hey, how you doing? We go bro hug here. Lip kiss is not happening. If that happens in this church and another guy walks up to me, okay, I'll have to fire myself for what ensues. It's not going to be good. <laughs> this is a standard Greco-Roman greeting, but the cool thing is, is how it actually kind of originated, and if you just kind of dig into it a little bit, that it was typically reserved just for family. It was actually reserved for people who you were the closest with, that members of your family. That's how you greeted members of your family, and then later with close friends. So it wasn't until long after that people just took it and was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Let's use that for anybody that you know, just gets off the airplane. But in this context, it was those people who, who were your closest people. It was your family. And when Peter says greet each other with the kiss of love, it, it's denoting an emotional and a spiritual affection for each other. When he says one another there again, in this context again, he's it's like saying you're not just part of another social club, you're not just part of another group, you're not just part of another class of people that you are family. And our little slogan on the wall back there where guests become friends and friends become family. I think you can tell a lot about relationships by the way that people greet each other, can't you? You can tell a lot about relationships by the way that people greet each other. Maybe you've been in that church context where you walk in and you're there and nobody says hi and nobody talks to you and 
you find a seat and you sit down and you're there for the whole service and it's a little awkward because everybody's looking at you and nobody's saying hi. The pastor does that weird mandatory greeting thing, you know, stand and greet each other and everybody's like, hi, how are you? Or they just walk right by you and it's weird and it's awkward and then you get up and you leave and nobody talks to you, right? You can tell a lot about people by the way that they greet each other, can't you? Some of you have come to this church and, and Lord help us, you've been accosted. Like, you walked in the front door, and it's like, fresh meat! Ah, hi! People are fighting over who gets to greet you, right? Merle's pushing people out of the way. I love, I love Merle. We try to get Merle on the greeting team, and he's like, no, they're too lazy. I'm going to greet everybody, <laughs> which I appreciate. Like, it's amazing, right? You know how I many people come here, and it's like, there is this, excuse me, this little old guy, and he just was so friendly, and he was amazing, and he was so nice, and they come back because the guy's like Merle. Like, you can say a lot about people by the way they greet each other. And you can say a lot about the collective feel of a church community by the way that we greet each other. By the way that we say hi to each other. The way that we look forward to coming to church, okay? You can, you, you can, you can say a lot about a church community by what happens over there at the donut, whatever. All right? There's donuts everywhere. People are digging in. It's like, that's because we're comfortable with each other. and We love each other. We're big family, right? You go to somebody's house, you're not comfortable, you're eating a donut, it's like, oh, what if I get this on something? Y'all don't have that problem here. I know that because I go out there on Monday mornings, I see the carnage that's ensued. It's a mess, right? When he talks about greeting each other with the kiss of love, he's talking about warmth. He's talking about connection. He's talking about people who want to be around each other. He's talking about people who look forward to being together with each other. And church, that's a big deal. Like, I've been there, been to those churches where it's like, this just feels like a bunch of people filing in, listening to a sermon, and filing back out. And here's where the rubber meets the road on that. About a third of you have been around here less than a year, maybe less than two years, right? And what happens is we become less familiar with other people. One of the things that can happen is we can become a little bit more closed, right? Right? As ski seats become more scarce, we can have the mentality of, I need to get in here and get my seat marked and then sit in my seat to make sure no one takes it. One of the beautiful things about Piot Community Baptist Church is the way that we greet each other, the way that people care for each other, the way that you hang around till 1 o'clock in the afternoon talking to each other. Okay, the deacons are working on how to alleviate that problem. No, but seriously, it's so important for us as a church family that as we grow and as more new people come here that we maintain that feel. Some of my friends have, have come who are pastors have come and have looked at what's going on here and said, you guys got to go to two services now. If you don't go to two services, you're going to stop growing because people won't find a seat and they'll go somewhere else, right? And maybe the day comes when we have to go to two services. But the reason that Lauren and I are reticent to do that right now is because we love the spirit that exists here. We have at least four families who have four generations sitting in these pews together. Great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, and kids. At least four families that we know of. Do you know how amazing that is for a church of under 200 people? And you're all sitting in the same pews at the same time. And if you complain about the music, it's probably like collective. And if great-grandpa doesn't like the music, then maybe great-grandson can say, Grandpa, get over it, right? And that's really healthy for a church, right? There's balance. But we love that. If the time comes where we have to do that, we will work hard to make sure that we still maintain this supportive spiritual family together. That's why discipleship groups are so important. And we continue to try to work on ways of making those better is so that as the church grows larger, and again, as, as my friend Jason says, as your flight pattern for relationships gets full, because that happens to all of us, that there's somebody here with a flight pattern still open enough to accept a few new flights, right? Accept a few new people in. And a few new people to have the opportunity to be able to get really connected with people. Part of that is your responsibility to come in and to find a place to get connected. But we want to make that a place that's easy for you. One of the things that I've read before and that I love that talks about what we hope that church would feel like as you come in on a Sunday morning is an excerpt from, um, this is a book called Instructing a Child's Heart, but the poem is called The Glorious War. 
And it says this, it says, We stop for a moment from the unending struggle with our foe. We live for a day as though we were already victorious. He's talking about people coming to church. Like victorious warriors returning from battle, we crowd into the hall of our king. That's Jesus. We sit down to the feast that he has prepared for us. We look forward to the day when the battle will be done. When the final enemy will fall, when the ruler of our king, or the rule of our king will be on pose, imposed on the whole created order, when everlasting night will be cast down forever and chaos is abolished. On that day, the enemies of order will fall and never rise again. So in we come like conquerors, and we join one another at the table and rejoice in our victorious king. We take our rest for a brief time. We're not surrounded by enemies on all sides. The whole world does not strive against us or seek to destroy our resolve. We are surrounded by comrades, our brothers in arms, heroes in the battle. On the first day of the week, we return to war. We're renewed. Our armor's repaired. It's even made stronger. Our hearts, which might otherwise despair of so long a struggle, are made strong. Our wounds are bound up and healed. Out we go to war for the glory of our king. We are not weary. We do not lose heart. We give no ground to the enemy. We advance. We look forward to the coming Sabbath, and we long for our eternal rest. Dude, if that was church, it'd be a lot easier to get up for, wouldn't it? That's what church is supposed to be when church is a supportive, spiritual family together. And that's what we want to see happen here. We want to see this be a place where you come in and you're lifted up and you're strengthened. And that whatever you're facing out there in a difficult world, this is a place of hope for you. Supportive, spiritual family. That leads to the last phrase in the book. And it leads to the most important relationship of all. He says, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is not the absence of war. Peace is not just the absence of fighting. Peace is not the absence of all of your problems. Peace doesn't mean that all the bad stuff in your life went away. Peace, shalom, peace means wholeness means order is restored it means things go from the way that they shouldn't be to the way that they should be from brokenness to complete whenever a new testament or an old testament writer is proclaiming peace to someone they're proclaiming wholeness to someone chapter 1 verse 2 of first peter he said may grace and peace be multiplied to you Chapter 1, verse 2. Now he ends the entire book by saying, Peace be to all of you. There's one way to true peace. There's one way to true peace amidst the suffering in a difficult world. There's one way to living hope. And that's why the last two words in the whole book may be the most important words in the whole book. Peace to all of you who are in peace. Christ. The last two words are probably the most important words in the book. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. To be in Christ means that you're a child of God. You're a follower of Jesus. You're a Christian. You've turned from your sin and turned to God. It means you've stopped trying to be your own Savior and you've trusted in Christ as your personal Savior. You've trusted in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Peace is only possible in Christ. Hope is only only possible in Christ. Salvation is only possible in Christ. Eternal life is only possible where? In Christ. All other relationships mean very, very little. You can have all of those other relationships that we've talked about, and they can mean very, very little if you're not in Christ. The last two words are the most important words because it's talking about having a relationship with Jesus. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you need to trust Christ for your salvation. You need to admit that you're a sinner and that sin separates you from the greatest relationship of all relationships. 
And that sin, unrepentant sin, is separating you from the hope that you long for and the peace that you desire and the life that you really want to live and can't quite figure out why you're not living it. It's because the most important relationship is broken. Your problem with your spouse isn't just a problem with your spouse if you're not in Christ. Your problem with your kids, your problem with your job, your problem, all the problems that you have. If you're not in Christ, that's your biggest problem. You need to become a Christian. For those of you who are Christians, as we end this book and we end this sermon, there are five hope strengthening relationships and my question to you today would be how are your relationships who is helping you maintain living hope in a difficult world who are you ministering with who's investing in you who are you investing in how are your spiritual relationships as we end the book as we end the sermon series we need these relationships. What can you do this week to continue to grow those relationships? We're going to close the sermon. We're going to close the 